Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, the debate over legalizing marijuana for recreational use. Two lawmakers provide their perspectives, plus a conversation on legalizing sports betting and the lessening of the addictiveness of social media. Stay tuned for this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Using cannabis for medicinal purposes became legal in Minnesota in 2014. Now, the DFL is pushing for the legalization of recreational marijuana with a statewide tour to promote the law change. Joining me to talk more about the effort is Senator Jeff Hayden. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Your colleague, Senator Melissa Franzen, authored the bill to legalize cannabis last session, mm -hmm. but it was voted down by Republicans in committee. At that time, you authored a bill that pushed for a task force mm -hmm. to study the issue of legalization. Mm -hmm. But now you're moving ahead with full-blown legalization. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, I think what we saw when we talked to people around Minnesota, we saw it at the state fair this year, and there's been other conversations, that people are really uh, want this to happen. That the medicinal or uh, medical cannabis program that we have has limited access and cost a lot of money. So there's actually some work that we probably should be doing on that. But there are so many people who get caught in the process of wanting to be able to use cannabis legally. Uh, some of it, a lot of it is for, you know, health care issues and others that we think it helps. And then just in general, people want to use it. And we think that the best way to do it is to get it from the underground or illicit economy and to regulate it, tax it, and make it in, uh, in, the, in the regular sphere of, of, of things in which we do when we want to have fun. In your experience, then, are the people who are advocating for its legalization using it differently than the way we might remember from the 70s with the comedies and the movies with the smoky rooms and the people acting silly. You're saying people are using marijuana differently than then? Yeah, we like to say this isn't your grandma's cannabis, if you will, that there are many different ways and people can use it in other states. Obviously, there are edibles. Um, there are different ways that you can ingest it that we believe are safe. Just recently, we're seeing a scare of people that are vaping uh, cannabis, but that's coming from bootleg or, or on the illicit side of things. Um, we haven't found that same problem when people were getting it legal from legal cannabis from states that actually regulate it. So we think that there's a great opportunity for that to happen in Minnesota and we not to hear these tragedies of people getting stuff that they don't know where it's from on the illicit market and actually are able to use it um, effectively and safely. Another argument for legalizing recreational cannabis is rectifying a broken criminal justice system, which has taken a particularly heavy toll on poor and minority communities. How would this be accomplished? We, we spoke about this offline. Um, would people who are currently behind bars be let out? Would records be expunged? Would there be some kind of reparation for people who whose educational and employment opportunities have been limited due to convictions in their records? Well, we certainly are, um, as, a, as a kind of a cornerstone of this, is to take a look at those that have possession charges. And we'll have to decide at what level do we go. Some people really want to go all the way up to, say, the gross misdemeanor felony level. Some want to just be kind of a simple misdemeanor. But what we do know is that that being on their record has stopped them from being able to take advantage of educational opportunities, uh, economic or employment opportunities. And we think there's a great opportunity for those records to go away. Then in addition to that, we'd like to be able to create and carve out an economic development fund that allows uh, potential people who want to get in the business, especially those in communities that have been impacted by the war on drugs, that's been impacted by their communities having so many people going in the criminal justice system, that they get an opportunity to take advantage of the economics of cannabis. And how would that work? I, was, I read in MinPost that Corey Day, who is a former DFL operative, formed a political action committee along these lines that would, um, in terms of econom the economics of legalization, taxation, revenue, entrepreneurship. How could the legislature write a bill that would direct the benefits of that to those communities that have had those adverse effects of this being illegal for so long? So, uh, for instance, I just came from a, a convention or a conference 
um, in New York. And so the state of Massachusetts has done some work on this. And part of what they've done is taken a look at neighborhoods and communities and people who have been disaffected by that and that they have carved out a fund that allows those communities to be able to come in and take advantage of, for instance, capital or other kind of, you know, getting at the top of the regulatory structure to be able to develop that. A lot of that is going to have to be in the legislation. We're going to have to do some studying, obviously, uh, of the economic impact. And then, uh, and then there's also going to be what we would hope is some local control that also kind of helps us understand what communities would like for that to happen. We believe that those communities would benefit from it. And that creates an environment in where just large multinational corporations don't come in and dominate the marketplace, that we can actually have this as a more cooperative model or a model that people uh, that have been disproportionately affected by that, unfortunately, a lot that looks like me, gets an opportunity to legally uh, be able to sell cannabis. Because marijuana has been classified as a Schedule One substance, there's been limited research on its effects. Mm -hmm. I believe that is beginning to change. Mm -hmm. Some research suggests adverse cognitive effects for adolescents mm -hmm. who use the drug who might be able to get access to it more mm -hmm. easily if it becomes legal. Also, the National Institute for Drug Abuse says that 30% of people who use cannabis will uh, form some kind of addiction or dependence to it. Like alcohol and tobacco, they, these, these things pose health risks. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense mm -hmm. to have another potentially addictive substance become legal? Well, I guess we could look at it a couple of ways. I'm really concerned about that. I want a portion of revenue that if this becomes law to make sure that it goes into not only the research but also prevention and the chemical health side. I think that that's really important for those that may be impacted uh, that way. Um, but I also know that the illicit side, that often people who are uh, addicted or have substance use disorder find a way in which to be able to get the products that they want. At least in this instance, if they were able to buy it, they can know that there won't be the kind of additives that, ca that create the issue. There won't be, it won't be laced with something like fentanyl, which, you know, really takes you out pretty quickly, or has some illicit oil that coats your lungs that you can't breathe, that at least you know that the product uh, has gone through a, a regulatory process. And so, so and I, I want to back up to say, we aren't suggesting that there isn't harm uh, with a product like this. We're just saying that the harm that's happening now through becoming addicted or through the criminal justice system is greater than if we think that we get this into a marketplace and we regulate it. So yes, we'll admit that there'll be some harm. We're trying to weigh the risk on the issue and we believe having a product that is safe to consume, at least from a healthcare perspective, and then if you do develop a dependency to it, we're helping to backfill that system to be able to help you, much like we do with alcohol, nicotine, and other issues. One final question. Uh, is it wise to move forward before law enforcement has a reliable way to test for impairment? Well, I think that that's a two-part question, right? There's like the, 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 the medical side of that and the research side to continue to find ways to test for impairment, to figure out the difference in people's uh, body composition. Uh, law enforcement will have the ability to decide if a person is impaired if, say, they're driving. There are other ways to do that other than just simply a blood test or a breathalyzer. They'll have that ability and they have that in other states. So yes, we want to listen to law enforcement. Our tour really is not only this idea to go full blown, but it really is to listen to everybody in Minnesota and to get an understanding, everybody from the agricultural community, law enforcement, and people in the urban core who have a lot of uh, 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 views on this issue, and also those who really don't like this, and we want to hear from them. So we want to hear from it, but law enforcement is just one part in one, one constituency <laughs> group that we have that we need to be able to listen to. And so if they make a compelling argument that we need to do something differently, uh, I think my ears, of course, my caucus, uh, Representative Winkler, and, whole, and frankly, the whole legislature, this though is being driven uh, by uh, our caucuses. We really want to hear uh, from the whole legislature. It's going to take all of us to get this over the finish line. I know the governor has a separate kind of process that he's working through so that he better understands the issues, but we want to listen to him. Senator Jeff Hayden, I hope to hear more. Thank you so much. Thank you.
Governor Tim Walz recently requested that state agencies prepare for the possibility of recreational marijuana use becoming legal in the state. Joining me to offer his perspective on this, as well as potentially legalizing sports betting and the growing effects of social media addiction is Senator Roger Chamberlain. Thank you for being here. Good to be back. On many issues, you have a more libertarian bent. And last session, when I asked you about marijuana legalization, I was surprised at how vehemently you oppose it. Considering the adverse health effects and addictive qualities of things like alcohol, gambling, and tobacco, why should marijuana be treated differently? It's poison, pure and simple. There is no academic research, serious academic research, that suggests in any way that recreational, continued recreational use of marijuana is of any benefit to any citizen at any time. Medical use marijuana even has limited use. To suggest that we're gonna say Minnesota should subject itself and its citizens to this stuff is complete and utter lunacy. Lunacy. It is gonna destroy this society. It will not improve the schools. It will not make your communities or roads safer. Kids will get it in gummy bears. If you legalize it for adults, it becomes normalized. You normalize it, kids will get it, people die. The, the real life effects are from Colorado and other states. It's a disaster. Any money that they think they can raise from uh, peddling this poison, and that's what they're doing, they're peddling poison and death. Is going to be wiped out. Colorado's experience and the studies and the research from them suggest and say that if you, for every dollar they get in revenue, $4.50 is used to clean up the mess created by this stuff. This stuff is, uh, leads to uh, mental health problems, schizophrenia, other psychosis. The American uh, AMA has studied this and suggested the same. American, the American Medicine Association. Association, American Medical Association, the Psychiatry Association. Uh, mental health counselors, drug counselors, everybody, school teachers, uh, employers, district attorneys, the list of negatives go on and on. There is no positive to adding this poison to the community. We live with alcohol, but marijuana is much, much worse. If we wave, wave a magic wand and get rid of uh, alcohol, sure, but we can't. It's just there. But it's, marijuana is much, much worse than this. There is no academic study that suggests it's good. And lastly, at a time when we are trying to get rid of opioid abuse, we are combating opioid abuse and the deaths of citizens from opioids and vaping. They want to ban vaping and continue the fight on cigarettes. They say, well, let's go ahead and legalize this poison, which is a whole world worse than vaping. So, and even worse than cigarettes. Cigarettes won't cause you give you a psychosis and schizophrenia. Well, let's talk about the social justice aspect of this because uh, I believe evidence has shown that African-American communities, communities of color, poor people have been incarcerated at higher rates for their use of marijuana and other drug-related <coughs> crimes than their counterparts in the white population. One aspect of the current DFL proposal would seek to ensure that economic, entrepreneurial, <coughs> and taxation benefits that would be raised from legalizing the drug and having um, and the DFL has argued then there's regulations on it and make it safer than what's <coughs> currently available on the black market. That money could be directed to communities who have been more adversely affected by this and, and, and in a sense be a kind of reparation. This is lunacy. If he wants to do anything for his community, he should get to us and talk about dyslexia and literacy. He could get to us and talk to us about getting their kids in better schools. He should talk to us about real economic opportunity and breaking down these regulatory barriers to keep people trapped in poverty. He is a chief architect of many of these policies that have kept his own citizens and his own people trapped in this, in this cycle of poverty and uh, dead ends. There's a lot of ways to do this. Secondly, I'm all for parole and probation reform. I've been on the record for that for a long time. I was part of so the So you agree the that, that these um, drug only offenses perhaps should be we should um, look released at or uh, records expunged? Minnesota's record uh, across counties is very inconsistent. We need to make it fair and consistent and look at and treat addicts as patients and people have been abused by the system. What the government wants to do is become part and parcel the pusher of poison into these communities. What he's suggesting will not help his communities, but will make their lives worse. And by the way, 
when they talk about regulations and fixing things, there's always disparities that are created. The people are going to be positively affected and come out on top are the rich folks and the smart folks. The, most of the people that are going to be left at the bottom, the lower uh, class, lower income, poorly educated, are the ones going to take the brunt of this abuse and the poison and suffer the effects. So this across the board, Shannon, is complete lunacy. I will never support it. It's harmful to people. It is not the role the government should play in this, uh, in this state. It's just not. We have to find a balance of what, it's not a perfect world. We have to find a balance somewhere. And we have to have some constraints and some liberties. This is not something we should legalize for general use because it will cause a whole world of hurt that people don't understand yet. Let's turn to legalizing sports betting. Uh -huh. Your bill passed the Senate Tax Committee, but its House companion did not get a hearing. Iowa, however, has crossed the finish line, and mm -hmm. so now Minnesotans can just drive south mm -hmm. a couple hours from the Twin Cities. Yeah. What are the barriers to legalizing sports betting here in Minnesota? Well, there's a, it's complicated. There's a lot of things. Governor Waltz at the State Fair suggests that he supports it, he's open to it, he's willing to talk about it and uh, move forward with it. I have, uh, it's a bipartisan approach to this. It's a harm, it's harmless entertainment, it's a business, it's equivalent to, people have opinions, a bookmaker for 40 years has said this, people have opinions, they wanna invest in those opinions. This is no different than the stock market. People are wagering on, on whether a business is gonna succeed or fail, short term, long term, mid term, and hedging their bets all the time. This is just stock market for sports. That's all this is, and the people, it does not expand gaming, because they're already doing it. We have lottery, we have, Pull tabs, we have, um, uh, of course, the casinos. It doesn't expand it. It's harmless entertainment. It's a business. And frankly, the barrier is going to be the tribes. We got to talk to the tribes and get, some, uh, get them to understand that this is not a threat to their business. But uh, they got to give way so that, look, people tell me all the time this is what they want. They want sports betting. It's harmless. People are doing it already. Nobody's going to get in a car and kill somebody because they made a bet. If you smoke marijuana, there's no equivalency here. You smoke marijuana, you take THC and gummy bears, you're going to get in a car and kill somebody. This what? won't do it. Okay, but one more thing then. Yeah. So our theme today is dealing with things that are potentially yeah. addictive. Last session you introduced a bill that would require a social media plat or all social media platforms to use a banner <coughs> warning that would talk about the mental health disorders, lack of sleep, and social alienation that can occur from overuse of social media. Yeah. Are you planning to continue that um, endeavor this coming session and first and also what how do you define social media well yes we're going to continue we're going to come out with a different bill a different approach uh, look um, again we have to have balances and I'm about fair and equal treatment of everybody and if you've done something wrong you had to be held accountable these social media companies created a product to treat us as products not as customers to treat us as products they intentionally designed it to addict people. It has happened and is causing great harm, especially to our youth. The studies and the data are just like the marijuana thing. They're conclusive, they're clear, that it is causing great harm. So those folks that designed it and created it and addicted it and are using and abusing people because of it, they have to be part of the solution and they should pay for some of that solution. So I'm working with, and I tell you, I got the same, uh, psychiatric and psychology professionals and uh, mental health counselors and family health counselors on board with the same thing. Parents, teachers, educators, principals, to the last person agree that something has to be done. Now they're trying to do things in the schools. We are here to help them and assist them. And we're not gonna ban anything, but those people who've done this should be held accountable. This is akin to cigarettes, same thing. They addicted people to it. They have to pay for it. They're going to be part of the solution, and we're going to get folks to pay attention to it. And I wish, uh, if we want to talk about mental health and doing something for the state, let's talk about literacy. Let's talk about dyslexia. Let's talk about these things that are clearly causing problems. Marijuana will enhance those problems and make them worse. I am making suggestions to improve those, and there are others doing the same. Join us. Have fun. Let's get this fixed for people and not make their lives worse. Senator Chamberlain, I'm sure we'll be talking about this more as the session comes around, but I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you very much.
Minnesota State Capitol was constructed and adorned with more than 20 types of stone from Minnesota and around the world. State Capitol historian Brian Pease tells us more. The Minnesota Capitol incorporates stone from all over the world, and architect Cass Gilbert ruffled some feathers when he chose a Georgia white stone for the exterior. Why did he make that choice? What he was trying to do is emulate what he had seen in the Chicago World's Fair or the Columbian World's Exposition of 1893. That was called the White City. And so that whole concept was you're trying to bring back the uh, center of democracy, which would have been Greece and Rome, and you'd bring back those architectural features to help inspire those citizens and the people elected to work in those buildings. And that was stone, the stone from that, that area was white. And so he wanted that Georgia marble stone because that was a beautiful white stone, relatively newer quarries. They hadn't been really exhausted or used a lot until uh, the 1890s. And so this was a, a perfect stone, he thought, for the exterior of the building. It, it did create some controversy because what you want in Minnesota when you're building your own state capital is Minnesota stone. So we have plenty of granite and we have sandstone and limestone. So people were saying, let's help the people of the state by building our capital with materials we can take it out of the ground right within our boundaries. And so he pushed against that. Um, and the other part of that too was uh, you had the, the unions, you had the carpenters and you had the stone cutters and carvers and all the people that are supposedly getting jobs here. You want them to have the jobs to do the stone carving here. So the fear was if you buy stone from Georgia, they're gonna cut the stone out of the quarry, they're gonna dress the stone down in Georgia. All the people in Minnesota are gonna lose those job opportunities. So they worked out a compromise. They did, yeah. So the Butler Ryan Company, the general contractors to build this capital, went down to Georgia, bought the quarry, and now you cut out that middleman. So now you can send up all the materials raw, and in the northwest uh, corner of the capital building site, they built their own stone mills and, and stone carver sheds. So people were hired from Minnesota and the, the local areas to do that work on site. So it was a win-win for everybody. I counted at least 21 different types of stone in the capital. Why is there so much variety? Well, Cass Gilbert once again is trying to recreate these Italian Renaissance buildings. And so they were bringing in stone from all over Europe. And so you have, because of that variation of colors and tones, you can really create some beautiful architectural vistas. And you can look down one end of the building to the other and see different types of stone, different colors. And so he incorporated as many of those different stones from throughout the world as he could to incorporate into the decoration. And some of them are really small scale stones and others are huge columns from Italy, for instance. And you have stone, uh, the stone points in the star and the rotunda, those uh, pinkish, orangey uh, triangles are from Africa. And then there's the balusters and the railings on the second floor are all from Greece. And so there you just get a good sample of some of the stone that he was bringing in to make this a really beautiful building. And so here we are on the second floor, the grand floor of the rotunda, and there are columns all around. Some are Italian, some are Minnesota. Talk about the different kinds of stone and how we incorporated it into this space. Right. They, once again, you have this palace to talk about all these different types of stone from throughout the world. But you also want to remember this is Minnesota state capital. So the second floor rotunda is really a showplace of that Minnesota stone. All the interior wall stone is a Casota limestone, which is a pretty common building material today. He was one of the first to actually use that rougher limestone, have it buffed and polished to look like, make it look like a marble. And so that's what we see on the walls right here around Right, us. and then that set the whole color tone for the rest of the interior decoration. You know, what matches those, those tan tones throughout the building. Plus he used these big columns, granite columns from Minnesota on the east and west side of the second floor rotunda, some huge granite columns from Ortonville. So once again, you're showcasing some of that granite industry of the state. And so then above those columns, uh, there's a pink ribbon of stone and that's Sioux Quartzite. So that represents the southwestern corner of the state where there's a lot of deposits of this, this reddish stone that you'll find throughout uh, that corner of the state of Minnesota. So once again, it's a place that you're talking about government, and the state history, but also state products as part of that decoration. I've been told that at least one type of stone in the capital is now extinct. Is that true, and which one is it? Yeah, we, we believe the, uh, the stone that you'll find in the Senate chamber, which is called a fleur de peche, which in French is peach flower, and it's a really beautiful 
purple marbled and huge grained uh, uh, texture to that and it's a really uh, unique stone to this entire building and so we believe the stone that we use, use in, that, in that chamber no longer exists in France. The quarry, because it's been quarried for so many centuries, is pretty much gone. Some people say that the Italian columns that are outside the Senate chamber and also outside the Supreme Court were not put together properly and that's why the columns don't match. Is that true? That, that's a, a good story that's been perpetuated for many generations in the Capitol, but we do have uh, letters that Cass Gilbert is writing to the Butler Ryan Company as they're doing the final kind of tweaking of those, those spaces. And he delineates, and he has a circle on for each one of these big colonnades that he wants on the center section, that one center piece turned one quarter this way. He wants another section taken from this column and moved to the other side. So he was fine tuning them with the intention of them not matching. So the idea was he wanted to have a variety of colors and patterns. So when you looked up and down that second floor, grand floor, you would see these beautiful vistas and you would have kind of just all these different colors coming together. And it's, when you take a close look, he did, he was very careful of where he wanted the different color schemes. So if you look toward the Senate side, the big columns that are in three pieces, those are all from uh, Italy, of course, but they all have a reddish to grayish tint to it. The ones on the Supreme Court side all have a greenish and gray tint. So he didn't have those colors mixed and matched. He wanted them separate for each side of the second floor. So from a historian's perspective, what stones represent Minnesota? What's the most important stonework that's in the Capitol building? Well, we talked about the Casota limestone, which is prevalent throughout every floor of the state capitol. So that really is the kind of the, the stone you'll see when you walk into the building. But we mentioned the granite columns from Minnesota. There's also the granite steps and foundation from the outside. So that was part of that compromise that Gilbert could use the white stone, but also needed to incorporate some granite and Minnesota local stone in the exterior. And that, that, that really is, it gives a good contrast of kind of this speckled, darker base, and then you get this beautiful white building in its dome looming above that foundation. And then as part of the restoration of the, the state capitol, we, we tore out the basement walls that had been down there before and exposed all the Minnesota limestone foundation stones. And so there, that's a perfect example of where you'll see additional Minnesota stone that you couldn't see for, for decades before that restoration. So, so it was hidden before the restoration, it was all, nobody even knew. Right, it, they were all painted. There were walls that were, you know, one central tunnel that blocked off all the access to these other spaces that are now exposed and available for the public to view. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.